starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which we'll, we'll be taking a look at the value of integrated IT asset management and IT service management. My name is Ollie O'Donoghue and I'll be your host for today, and I'll shortly be joined by Patricia Adams from Landesk, who are also our, our webinar sponsors, so thank you Landesk. Um, please ask pro, uh, questions throughout the presentation, as we'll have plenty of time at the end um, to, to discuss those and, and have a chat with Patricia about some of the answers there. Now a little bit about our presenter, Patricia. Patricia has uh, over 21 years of experience in the industry and most recently has uh, taken on the role of the lead, uh, lead analyst at Gartner, um, mainly focusing on IT asset management. And every year Patricia speaks to hundreds of very diverse organizations about their IT service management and IT asset management. So uh, without further ado, hello Pat Patricia. Hello, Ollie. Thank you for having me today, and good day, everybody. Um, as Ollie mentioned, the presentation today is about the intersection between asset management and IT service management. And I do have a bio slide that's in included here, but Ollie already gave you a little bit about my background. Uh, just to add on to that, I was the uh, lead research director at Gartner for asset management tools, but I also covered discovery and inventory tools, dependency mapping tools, uh, would cover change management when we had a hole in coverage there, and also covered idle very early on when idle was starting to get traction in the marketplace, and also covered configuration management databases or CMDB or the most recent term configuration management system or CMS. And the reason I did that is that asset management overlaps with the CMDB and the CMS because they are sharing information about assets in the organization. So today we're going to talk a bit about what are the definitions of asset management um, service management you're all very familiar with. Um, we'll talk about the historical view and then what are some of the benefits of sharing asset and ITFM data and then talk about the different tools and metrics associated with it. So I always like to have a common definition of asset management because the term is so widely used in financial management systems, um, stockbrokers, traders, they talk about asset management, but they're talking about it in the, ter in the terminology of stock and portfolio assets. We also have a definition in the marketplace around enterprise assets, and enterprise assets are any asset that is like a truck, train, power plant, building would be considered an enterprise asset. Then there are also vendors in the market that call their tools IT asset management or software asset management solutions, when in reality they might just be discovery and inventory tools. So the definition that I've used for many years is that IT asset management has three key components to it. The first one is the physical component, and this is the who, what, and where about the asset. Who's using it? Where is it located? What does it look like? And this is data that is collected manually with barcode readers. If the, network, if the asset isn't on the network, maybe it's in a spare parts area or workroom, it's not going to be network attached. So there will be a manual process with tracking it there. But once it hits the network, you can use either an agent-based or agentless discovery tool to scan that asset to collect physical information about it. The second key component to asset management is the financial component. And this is data that is taken from purchase orders or purchasing systems, but it's giving key financial attributes about that asset, like purchase price, purchase date, quantity, um, depreciation or life cycle or amortization schedule that you might have the assets on. And then the third component 
is the contracts component. And this is all of the terms and conditions associated with that asset. So this includes license entitlements, if we're talking about software. It could also be training days, uh, serial numbers, uh, basically all of the terms and conditions about the asset, even including support information or service level agreements that you might have with your suppliers. You take the data from those three areas and consolidate it, and that's what IT asset management is. Just doing the physical piece is not managing the asset. That is asset tracking or asset counting. And it isn't until an organization can do all three aspects can they get visibility into what they've paid for the assets, um, what they have deployed in their environment, and what their contracts say they have the right to use in their environment. Now, this can include both on-premise assets, off-premise, cloud-based, software as a service, leased assets. So it can include all different types of assets that the organization owns. It can also be applicable to not just the mobile, laptop, servers, networking, storage assets, but could also include printers, monitors, telecom equipment, um, even video teleconference equipment or projection equipment. I mean, there are many different types of assets that an organization would want to track. Today, we're even seeing organizations that want to track IoT assets. So any asset that has a um, Wi-Fi and can be connected to the network needs to be tracked. Now, usually we would say we don't track an asset if the value is less than um, $500 or if the asset can't store data on it. So we used to have these old guidelines that were dependent upon how we would define whether it was an asset worth tracking or not. But with IoT and with cloud-based software, that definition of what a, is an IT asset or where the asset might be has definitely changed and is challenging asset managers today. So what is IT service management? Well, IT service management is basically about how work comes into IT. Um, you need to have certain things in place. You need to have good governance. You need to have process, policies, and analytics so that you can understand what the data is telling you about um, your service request, at whether that's incident, problem, change, knowledge. Where it starts to overlap with asset management is that as asset managers, we also need to have good process, right? Um, asset management is highly dependent on effective process. If an organization has the best tool in the world but doesn't have good processes to support it, the data isn't going to be that reliable. But in order for asset management to be effective, at the foundational level, we also need to have good governance in place. And how do we tell employees what to do, what's considered acceptable process? Well, that's by having these policies that outline for both the end user and IT what's considered an acceptable action when it comes to an asset. And then, of course, there's the piece around analytics, that if you're going to understand where your opportunities are for continuous improvement, you have to be able to report on that data and make sure that you're reporting on data points that are meaningful to the organization. So there's a lot of overlap between asset management and service management. I always define service management as the hands-on day-to-day maintenance of the assets and IT asset management as that 5,000-foot view that's the information hub that's tracking what's happening to those assets. So when it comes to 
this integrated story around asset and service management. The key challenge here is to find out how does it align with what your C-level goals and objectives are. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the CIO, the CTO, the chief security officer, the CEO, or even the chief financial officer, they might have their strategic IT roadmap for 2017 already mapped out where they're focused on doing a Windows 10 migration or rolling out a new ERP system or doing more digital business or potentially adopting artificial intelligence or other types of digital business um, applications. But whatever their goals are for 2017, and even at the year end here, wrap up of 2016, fundamentally what they all come down to is a focus on time, cost, risk, and quality of service. Now as they focus on rolling out these new projects, they might say, we're going to have to make a trade-off. Maybe the trade-off is short-term, meaning it's only going to last for three months, or maybe the trade-off will be a longer-term trade-off, something that um, might take a year to do. So if they're rolling out a new project or a new product, they might say, well, we want to gain competitive advantage. We want to release this product very quickly within the next 30 days. And because we're focused on that, our costs might increase as a result. Um, and at the same time, we might find that our quality of service in other areas declines while we throw resources at this project. Once the project is rolled out, we want to try and get things back into balance where time, cost, risk, and quality of service are really aligned um, and, and very carefully balanced. In reality, it's very difficult to get to that point because we're always rolling out new IT projects. However, from an ITSM and ITAM perspective, we want to make sure that we're talking to those C-level executives in terms that they understand. And what they're focused on is around these four factors. So we'll go into detail about that in a little bit, uh, in a little bit further in the presentation. So what are the top problems today that are organizations are facing that's driving this integrated view between ITAM and ITSM? Well, the first one is around the lack of visibility into assets, you know, not having a centralized view. Um, that was one of the benefits of having a CMDB, right? We have so many tools in the enterprise today, security tools, network management, um, app monitoring tools, everybody's collecting data, but it's staying within that domain and it's not being shared. And so having that visibility across all of the different data sources is really essential in order to um, make sure that customers are getting uh, access and knowledge about uh, their assets. Um, data center, uh, you know, it's the data center spend is a huge chunk of the IT budget today. And when there's an outage in the data center, it can be very costly to some organizations. So having effective change impact analysis is critical there. Understanding when you're going to make a change, which act assets are going to be impacted by that, which business services are going to be impacted, and which end users are going to be impacted. So that if there is a problem, we fix it before the change gets rolled out in order to reduce the downtime. Agility, um, you know, there's DevOps is very popular now. There's a lot of organizations that are starting to take more of a DevOps approach. On the asset management side, we're also seeing organizations take an asset agility or, or um, asset ops uh, approach too to ensure that they're supporting 
the need for the business to be able to stage, roll out changes, um, implement new software much faster, but they need to make sure they have the licensing to support that. Um, other areas here, faster incident identification, problem resolution, um, data center consolidation. We're seeing a lot of organizations starting to bring multiple global data centers together and try to consolidate down to one, two, or three data centers by region. So we do have a quick um, polling question here around um, uh, roles, uh, but one of the issues when it comes to um, ITAM and to ITSM is that we see where in the middle here there's an overlap in the roles that do both ITAM and ITSM, right? C-level, that's fairly obvious that um, that role is going to want access to information related to both ITAM and ITSM. Um, can you still see my slides here? Looks like I was bumped out. Uh, let me resume. Okay. Yeah, we've got the results of the, the the poll coming up here, so I'll just quickly read those out. So it looks like okay. ITSM sitting at about 64%. Um, IT asset management 29%. Sourcing and procurement and infrastructure and operations both have 0%, and others sitting at about 7% there. So it's uh, it's, it's it's relatively interesting turnout um, with, with both ITSM and ITAM represented strongly. Okay, I'm sorry. Could you tell me those numbers again, Ali? It was how many ITAM? Uh, do you know what? It's, it's just popped off the screen, but we're about there. We go back up again. So ITSM is 64%, and ITAM is 29%, with the okay. other 7% in the in the other category there. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, that's great because many asset management implementations actually. Um, do start in the service management area, right? Service management, because they're responsible for handling the requests, they might be the first area that would say, you know what, we need to have a more effective asset management program. And if we look at the roles down here in the center, um, these tend to be the executive sponsors for an asset management program. It could be the data center manager, it could be the enterprise architects or strategic planners who are making the decision about when to do a migration or an upgrade or to move off of a platform, whether it's hardware, software, or maybe even to put something into the cloud. Um, the portfolio managers, these are the people that are responsible for ensuring that the portfolio is current and that there isn't any legacy debt that's being accumulated. Security, right, we see security today as the one area within IT that has the most control over the IT budget, right? If there's a security incident, uh, whether it's ransomware or hacking or whatever it might be, you know, security typically has the budget that says, we need to whitelist these applications or we need to blacklist these unapproved applications. But we also see that asset management is not strictly an operational problem. It could also be a total cost of ownership problem, in which case it might reside within the sourcing or procurement area instead of within IT ops. And then there are also several times where I've seen asset management implementations be started as a result of internal auditors or even the legal team that was responsible for negotiating software audits say this is something that we need to have in place. But the audience you'll see can overlap and there is a lot of sharing of information and data that will be happening amongst these two groups. So they will be very closely aligned and working together. So if we look at an evolution of uh, service management, uh, you know, historically it used to be very siloed. We used to have people doing activities within their own domains 
and it was very isolated, the processes. Today, we see organizations starting to leverage more of this shared information across groups so that they can take an integrated view and it's not just the networking silo doing what they want to do in their silo or the desktop or client group or mobile group doing what they want to do in a silo. But it's about sharing the information so that everybody can become more collaborative, there's more visibility, and we're doing what we at Landesk call ITXM. And that X could be client management, asset management, service management, even security management. So it's about bringing all of those different domains together so that data can be viewed and shared in order to create efficiencies within the organization. Um, so we do have a quick polling question here about um, organizational value of um, asset management, if we could go to that poll. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to still keep on talking about, you know, where is that sharing or consolidating happening? Well, on the asset management side, as I mentioned, we've got um, the definition of a traditional IT asset expanding and growing. But we also have software vendors who are regularly changing their licensing models and the ways they sell. Today there's a big push from Microsoft and Oracle to get their customers on their cloud platform because they've found that it can maximize revenue. As a result, when they go out and do software vendor audits, part of the outcome of the audit is to get the customer to agree to move to the cloud platform. Now that's not always good for every organization because after uh, a TCO analysis you might find that the, after three years or five years or seven years depending how long you plan on using those applications the cost-benefit analysis might show that it doesn't make sense to do that. But we need asset managers that have the skill sets to look at that data, understand the data, interpret historical trends within the organization, and then take that data, analyze it, and apply it to specific business uh, decisions or taking action on it. And this can be a challenge in some organizations because today there is a skill shortage for qualified asset managers in the marketplace. And to get them um, is typically a 9 to possibly 18 month time frame in order to recruit asset managers. So a lot of organizations are looking to tools to provide more automation to help them with this skill shortage in the marketplace. Where we have the overlap between asset and service management, I've been talking around um, the, the concept, but right here, this is the most obvious area where asset and service management overlap, and that's in the area of request management. Um, you know, there are other processes, certainly, that overlap, um, and that's why a lot of the process automation uh, capabilities address some of these gaps that organizations will see maybe with discovery tools or contract licensing terms uh, that are differed, differing from um, what technicians understand them to be. But the request management area, this details the entire life cycle of the asset and of the request. And this is where if you're looking to build the business case for having a synergistic asset and um, ITSM program, this is where you would start it with request management. Because this is where the catalog, um, it might be a service catalog or it might be an asset catalog, where the approved list of assets are maintained but it's going to be the service management team that's going to be doing the fulfillment and the deployment, potentially even the configuration management team as well to assist with that. 
to help customers understand what their roadmap should be when it comes to asset management, at Landesk we have created an attainment model because many customers today are in reactive mode. They're constantly responding to software vendor audits that are making requests for um, audit activities within the organization, and it's very time consuming. I saw a data point recently that said that the average time frame for an audit is approximately two months, and I've seen some for major vendors take much longer time than that, it might even take eight, nine months to respond to a vendor audit. And what happens is that the asset team get stuck in a reactive position where they're just constantly responding to audit requests, um, validating available licenses, um, having those deployed, and renegotiating agreements. And what happens is they can't take a strategic view of where they need to go with their asset program. They're unable to see what else can they do with the data that they have available. So we've developed this attainment model that's a suggested roadmap for customers who need advice on what their next steps could potentially be. Now the majority of companies are usually between level zero and level one, um, but in order for the business to have confidence in IT, they should be at level two. Level two is where they've got dedicated teams, process, policy, governance, metrics in place, and their cost to deliver on services is significantly lower than it is at the reactive or the unmanaged initial levels. And if the business is going to have confidence in IT, being at this managed level is critical. Otherwise, the business will go out and buy what cloud applications, whatever cloud applications they want. Or they might go to an outsource provider to get services because they view IT as a bottleneck. When we get to level three, the shared service level, this is where asset is collaborating not just with service management, but with the security team, with the business with the disaster recovery team, the portfolio managers. It's taking that high level view and sharing that information so that higher level decisions can be happening within the organization. And then the business optimized view, this is not a level that every organization wants to get to, but some very technology centric companies do want to get to this. This is where you have cloud portability, where you can move your cloud instances based on price or uptime or SLAs that you have with your suppliers. And you're able to do um, more effective real-time licensing. And at this level, ITSM and ITAM are very tightly integrated and interwoven that it almost looks as if it's one team. To help customers understand how this maps to IT service management, we've also taken some of the documentation that's available from IDLE, but we've also mapped it to our experts' view of ITSM and where it aligns with asset management. So since ITSM is much more mature in the, or in the industry, it's easy for organizations to identify where they are from an ITSM perspective, but it's not as easy for them to figure out, oh, we have a structured life cycle approach from an asset perspective, or we're gaining the operational efficiencies that we're looking for from our asset that we're harvesting our unused software, we're reallocating it, we're monitoring our cloud-based software more effectively. So by mapping it to ITSM, it can help organizations understand where they should be going with their asset management program. One way to do this is to make sure that we have collaborative teamwork um, that's happening within the different groups. And this is one of the biggest challenges is that traditionally 
IT tends to have a, an isolated hero culture, but we need to be more collaborative across those different domains so that everybody understands what the business goals are and why we're all working together to deliver on that. The other challenge here, as I mentioned, is having so many different um, tools in the marketplace that it's it's a challenge for organizations to get that centralized view. Now, the centralized view could happen in the CMDB or it could happen in a CMS. It's highly dependent upon the organization's maturity and their ability to implement a CMDB. And CMDBs, I do not want to minimize how difficult they are. Um, we don't want them to be just a centralized database of all inventory within the organization, but we want them to show what the key business services are and the assets that make up those business services so that if there is a challenge from a security perspective, we can quickly look at the data and understand where the problems lie and what needs to be remediated. And the way to do that is around having accurate inventory or in insight. And we do have a polling question here on discovery tools. Ali, I have to apologize. I think I skipped the last um, polling question, but this one on discovery tools is about understanding if you have a network management tool or a security tool or if you have a client management or a unified endpoint management tool. Um, all of those tools have different sets of data that can be used to do efficient and effective asset management. But if that data is all reporting in as unique CIs or configuration items and hasn't been normalized properly, having a CMDB, you might end up with something that's the size of Texas and is not useful to an organization because you could have a mobile device or by a server is probably the best example, a server that reports in with a MAC address an IP address, a serial number, a barcode, a device name, and it might be discovered by four or five different tools and they're all reporting in as four or five different assets when in reality it's just one asset. So being able to normalize the data and ensure that the data is good, clean data is critical to the success here. Have we bounced out of the presentation? Yes, yeah, Joe, you know, it does. It looks like we, we've popped to the, the main screen. But just while you're uh, okay. popping out, I'll quickly read out the, um, the answers to that poll. So 20% uh, say one. So 20% of organizations have, have one discovery tool. 35% of organizations have um, between two and three. 25% between four and five. 10% five or more, and 10% don't know. Okay, so the 25% that have four or five and then there was 10% that had more than um, five, that is not unusual. I have in fact seen one organization that had up to 15 different discovery tools. And they had something for mainframe, something for Linux, something for Windows, for their mobile devices, for their network. They had so many different discovery tools, they couldn't decide which one could be used for asset management. And the problem was that they didn't have a tool that was fit for purpose here. So if you do have more than two discovery tools, you want to make sure that the data that you're getting from those two discovery tools is good, clean data and that it's normalized before it goes into the CMDB because that data will then be consumed by your asset management tool. Now, if you're only using one discovery tool, then terrific. It makes it easier for you. But if you're going to try and leverage that tool to do asset management, you want to make sure that it's collecting the information that you need to do asset management. You want to make sure that it's getting the depth around software. Discovering hardware is not as 
uh, complex as software, but you need to get down to the version level and um, the license key or the um, license entitlement if that's relevant as well to you. So that's no surprise to see multiple discovery tools like that. But foundationally, right, we can't manage what we don't know about. So if we don't have consolidated view from accurate discovery sources, discovery and inventory sources, it's going to be very difficult to do any of the things that I've talked about around asset and service management. So after we look at um, you know, the tool sets here, the other thing that we need to focus on at any level in your asset program or ITXM program is this idea of having metrics in place. And we do have another polling question about metrics at this time. But the key here is to make sure that your metrics are aligned with what your senior management teams care about. And early on in the presentation, I talked about time, cost, quality of service, and risk. Now, risk can include a lot of different things, not just security risk, but the risk associated with delivering a product on time or delivering within cost, within the budget or the time frame allocated for it. So you want to make sure that as you're building your reports to share with senior management that you understand that you communicate the results in terms that they all understand. Did the poll close there, Ali? I saw a flash on the screen. Yes, yes, we just closed the poll there, so oh, okay. I'll just give you a quick summary of, of the answers for everyone. So that's 53% uh, say yes to the question two of metrics that demonstrate business value, 40% say no, and 70% say say don't know, not sure. Um, so again, pretty interesting interesting spread of results there. Right, and, and that 47% need to recognize that if we don't communicate in terms that senior management understands, it becomes very difficult for them to maintain support or buy-in. So we have to make sure that we're getting the data that's relevant to them and that we're communicating those results back to them. I've seen some organizations do this on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis. It really depends on the rate of change within the organization. Um, one organization that I spoke with was going through a merger and they ended up having to report the results on a weekly basis because their organization was so dynamic at that time. So these metrics not only focus on what senior management is concerned about, but as we'll see with this next poll about reporting business value, um, it, it's an opportunity for us as managers to identify areas that might not be obvious to us that we can use to do continuous improvement. So usually we want to start out by baselining the environment, getting an understanding of how many assets we have, um, cost centers that they're allocated to, um, life cycle of the asset, when it needs to be refreshed, um, and then we start to look at opportunities for improvement, right? An opportunity might be around um, doing a migration to a, a new version or doing an upgrade to a newer version of a product. Um, and then we create these improvement plans that we have brought all of our stakeholders together uh, to discuss, right? And the stakeholders are those people that I mentioned at the shared level, but we also saw them in the roles that are involved with asset and service management. And we want to measure the improvements, right? Say our goal is to reduce our um, percentage of unplanned changes. Maybe we're running around 5 to 8% of a withdrawal rate for unplanned changes that were unsuccessful. 
and we want to reduce that. The industry best practice for change management in financial services firms is 2% of changes get pulled back. So if we want to move toward that direction, we need to make sure that we're collecting the data that we have about the assets that are related to those changes and about the success and have having very good um, targets for success defined there and communicate these results and communicate them in terms of cost, which is what senior management understands very clearly. So um, did we get the results of that poll back, Ollie? Yep, yep, certainly did. So 33% uh, have said yes, definitely, to my reporting communicates IT's value. 33% said sometimes, 22% said I wish it did, 6% said don't know, and 6% said we don't do that reporting thing. Okay, all right, great. Okay, yeah, and that does reflect what we see in the industry. Um, it, it's not surprising that this is an area that we still need to work on, right? And some of the dashboards and analytics in our tools with reporting capabilities are moving toward that direction to make sure that we're getting these more high-level reports. So, you know, in summary, what do you need to do if you want to embark on this integration path of having asset management and service management closely aligned? Well, you want to make sure that you've got a common focus on business objectives. So if the business objective is around change, if it's around rolling out new applications faster, whatever it might be, you want to make sure that there's a common focus there. And recognize that when you have a combined ITAM and ITSM program, you're actually creating agility in the organization. So today when we think about DevOps, it's about rolling out these new applications faster. But if we're going to roll things out faster, we need to validate that we have the available licenses and going with the enterprise license, we're actually spending a lot more money than we potentially need to spend, but we don't know that unless we have visibility and detail into that data. So you want to make sure that you also have collaboration in place, that the teams are all being motivated based on similar metrics and and measurements. You know, in ITSM, it's very common to measure people on first call resolution rate. However, if their desire is to drive down their first call resolution rate, they might find that they're deploying software faster than they should be because they don't have the time to confirm that there's an available license for software. So we need to make sure that the metrics that we're looking at measuring our people on are going to be conducive to the type of behavior we want to um, develop within the two groups. So the action plan here, we always like to give advice for organizations to get started out here. Um, find your quick wins. You know, they're going to be through the integrations of the various tool sets. Use the attainment model to understand what your next steps should be when it comes to asset management. Make sure that it's carefully aligned with what your service management processes are to do that. And then report on the benefits, the actualized benefits that you're getting, customer satisfaction, lower costs, um, more efficient contracting and negotiation. And then begin to look at what your critical business services are and look at adopting asset management practices and applying them to those critical business services so that when there is an outage, you know what the cost is of the outage. You know if you're going to guarantee an uptime for your customer, the business, that you're able to do that because you have the contracts and the vendors that are maintaining those assets able to deliver on those uptimes and um, those SLAs that you're offering for those business services. So now I'll I'll turn it over to you to see if there are any questions that have come in.
Hi Patricia, thank you. Thank you for a, a really detailed and informative presentation there. Now luckily we've got loads of uh, questions coming in, so apologies in advance if we don't quite get round to, to answering your question. We'll try and get back to you in, in some other way at the end of the, the, the presentation. Um, but to start off, we've got a, a nice general question here from, from Nigel, which is, we currently have no asset management program in place, where shall I start? So I guess it can be quite a a daunting prospect, especially in larger organizations. Do you have any, any top tips of places to start for Nigel? Absolutely. So the first thing I always recommend is to start by getting senior management support for asset management. Um, make sure that senior management understands why you need to do asset management and then have a senior sponsor for the program. Once you have that in place, you want to start to look at do you have any existing people within your organization that could staff an asset management program. Um, these skills, as I mentioned, are difficult to find in the marketplace. So if you have the opportunity to train somebody or have them learn on the job, that is one way to do that. There are a lot of third-party organizations out there that do training around asset management. One that I've seen um, most widespread is the International Association of IT Asset Managers. So start by making sure that you have the staff to fulfill on uh, the charter and the goals of the asset management program. And then begin by looking at your policies and processes that you have in place today. So you can get savings just by making sure that employees follow the policy. And the policy could be around centralized procurement or around software downloads. Um, then you also want to make sure that you have processes in place that can support those policies. Um, after those steps have been taken, then I would start to look at the inventory and discovery tools that you have to make sure that those tools are collecting the data that you need. Then from there, the next step would be to look at doing an asset management repository or an asset management database where the inventory information is going into, but you're also able to take data from a procurement or purchasing system or that there are B2B connectors to your software resellers or to your hardware suppliers so that you don't have to manually enter all of your purchasing information in there and bring all of that data in and centralize it. And then from there, I would say the next steps, you know, refer to the land desk attainment model if you'd like more information. But those, I would say, are your foundational things you need to do in order to get asset management off the ground. So it's, it's interesting. So I mean, your your first point was mentioning uh, mentioning senior management, um, and we've we've in a, in a couple of the polls established that some organisations have trouble. Um, articulating value with, with some of the reporting and data they have access to. But I guess that's sort of a, a great place to start if you do have that data to hand to um, justify the additional resources and time needed to start that, that asset management project off. I completely agree with you and this is the challenge is that asset management is perceived as a nice to have in many organizations and not a must have. So one way to do that is to tie it to recent um, events where you have costs associated with it. So if you've recently been audited, say within the past 12 months, you want to take that data, the cost of the time to go through the audit, and then the outcome of the audit. Now, I can tell you over in North America, if you're found out of compliance, legally a software vendor is allowed to charge up to $150,000 per instance of infringement. This is US copyright law and software falls under copyright law. So you can quantify what the cost is of that audit. If you've been audited and you have come out clean, 
um, you still want to calculate the cost of your people's time to respond to that audit um, because you've got database administrators, system engineers, legal team, everybody that's being involved in responding to that audit, and there's a cost associated with that too. So you want to be able to quantify that and report on that. If you have not been audited, another area to look at where there are hard dollar costs is around leasing. If you lease any assets, if you hold the lease, the asset, um, longer than the lease after it has expired by two months, your savings associated with leasing is basically gone. Uh, another area to look at is the cost of break-fix. Um, look at your metrics associated with outages and the cost to repair those. So I see a lot of organizations will take their assets and try and extend the life cycle. So rather than keeping their assets on a two to three year life cycle for laptops, they might say, let's stretch it out to four, five years, but they're just pushing the cost someplace else. It might increase the cost of their spare parts inventory, but it also might increase the number of calls that come into the service desk. So those are other areas where they can get hard dollar numbers in order to build the business case. Excellent, thank you. I mean, some of those were clear incentives to, um, to, to, to start asset management, really, some of those penalties involved. Um, very clear incentive. So John, there's, uh, there's another question. I think some of, some of your points there may help um, the, the, the responding who asked our, our next question. Um, but just in case, so Mary's asked, we're soon to begin a project to refresh all of the hardware in our organization. I think this would be a good time to overhaul our, our IT asset management program. Are there any tips to winning over stakeholders to my way of thinking? So we've mentioned um, data and reporting, but I think to, to tackle the, the, the first part of the question, um, in your experience, do you think that would be a good time to, to overhaul the asset management process uh, during that period of change? Absolutely, absolutely. And I do see a lot of companies tie asset management to a, a refresh process or time frame. Now, if you're keeping your assets for four years, you're probably refreshing 25% of the asset base. You want to make sure that you've got discovery tool installed on that endpoint. If you're using an agent, you want to make sure that you know who it was allocated to, what cost center it was associated with, and where it's going to be located. I actually just saw something in the news yesterday about a company that didn't have a good onboarding and offboarding process and refresh and offboarding kind of overlap. You need to have good governance about who's responsible for that asset. Right, who's responsible for getting it back? Is it IT? Is it HR? Is it security? But there was an instance in the news yesterday where an employee left the company and still had control of their asset, their laptop, and logged into the network after the fact and did some illegal activities that they got caught at doing. So it's not just around refresh, but it can also be built around an onboarding and an offboarding process as well. Okay, yeah, great. Um, you know, I think I think I saw the the article that, that you mentioned actually. Um, now for the, for the for the second part of the question, aside from the data reporting that we mentioned earlier, are there any other tips to winning over stakeholders to, to that way of thinking? So I guess that can be a hard sell in some organizations when they're already kind of in the middle of, of refreshing mm -hmm. loads, of, loads of equipment, then have something else attached to that can, can make that project a little bit cumbersome. So are there any other tips that you can think of just to finish this off with? Right. So this is where that person, that individual, is the business relationship manager that, um, and this might be the asset manager or asset director as well, but this is where we go to the business and we find out what their goals and objectives are for 2017, right? What, what are their high priorities? 
activities that they're trying to do and how can we support them in these high priorities. And it might mean, you know, taking somebody out for lunch um, on a monthly basis, depending on the size of your organization, or maybe doing it quarterly, but it's about having that connection so that you know what the business's priorities are. And then it'll help you decide, you know what, we should start to consider um, a creative cloud agreement instead of having an on-premise Adobe agreement because we realize that more of our workers are going to be remote workers or that um, we're going to be scaling up our headcount, we're going to be experiencing growth and it's going to happen very quickly. Or maybe we're doing planning a merger or a divestiture that's happening. So by having that relationship with people in the business, we can find out what their needs are and be proactive. So I recently talked to a company that was using Raspberry Pi devices as part of their program to ensure employee safety because they didn't want employees picking up manufactured assets that were too heavy for them. So they were using Raspberry Pi devices to weigh the shelves that the product was sitting on. So here's a use case that takes into account IoT, but also employee health and employee safety. And the asset manager, by working with the business and going out and talking to them, was learning about what direction they were headed in and what priorities. And so even though the Raspberry Pi is a low-cost device, commodity device, they he started to manage the contracts for them and the warranty associated with it and maintained additional spare um, devices so that if something broke, they could easily get it fixed and a replacement could be out to the shelf in the same day so that there was no risk um, to people being hurt in any way. So by acting as a relationship manager and talking to the business, I think we're taking more of a proactive approach to doing asset management instead of a reactive one, waiting for the business to come to us. We go to them. And then it, it builds that relationship, but also shows that um, we want to be an enabler. We don't want to be viewed as a utility that's in the boiler room. We want to be able to support the business in delivering on their goals and objectives. So I think that's, a, that's an absolutely perfect note to, to end the webinar on, actually, that um, summary at the end and that story of, of an organization using asset management to enable the business. That's great. Um, again, apologies to, to all the people who've asked questions that we haven't quite got around to. I'll try and uh, reach out to you um, when I've got a, a chance. Of course, thank you. To to, to Patricia, thank you for, for presenting really interesting topic um, and really interesting presentation. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you for having me. And if I can answer any other questions for anybody, don't hesitate to reach out. I can be reached at patricia.adams at landes.com or on Twitter at Patricia Adams. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, just a final thank you to Landes for sponsoring um, today's webinar, and thank you all for listening. I hope to see you along at the uh, at the next one. Thank you. Bye now.